we were stuck in traffic in Aba, the industrial city of Abia State. It was afternoon. The day was storied. Cars hung and their exhaust pipes coughed fume. Look, my sister said, pointing outside the car window. I followed her gaze and saw, for the first time, a body mangled by the aftermath of flame, smoke rising slowly from its remains. Soon after, the traffic flowed. Our car drove past the site, but the image stayed. He had stolen, people said, and as punishment, the mobs set him alight. He burned brightly and became charred. In my early years, this was what I knew of black skin darkened beyond recognition. Punishment, humiliation, entertainment. This perspective, however, changed when, as a new adult, I encountered the paintings of Peter Uka. Uka's paintings placed on naturally black bodies in scenic atmospheres, their skins contrasting sharply against colorful backgrounds. In some of his works, the features of his characters are muted, but the mood about them is not gloomy. Rather, it brings with warmth, with comfort. In vibe, four dancing figures are sporting Afro hairstyles and bell bottom trousers, their feet rooted on a gray floor. In the background, a pale yellow wall accentuates their blackness. Aside from painting characters driving on the dance floor, Hooker also paints characters in banal activities, paintings that pull us into quiet moments. The tonal range in his works, the use of patterns, the intense colors, and the exaggerated contrast are reminiscent of pictures in English reader books I used in primary school. And this acute reach into the mind's eye of a child was what, on encounter, fascinated me the most about his works, reawakening in me the magic of my childhood wonder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zenas. Thank you very much for, for your reading. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Let's have David come on to continue his reading from where he stopped. David, please. Apologies for the breaking in transmission, please. You so, have the I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it was that it cut out. So I'll just go back if you like. All right, please. Eventually, I organized the back channel meeting with a Derco official who said that while the policy would be upheld at airports, and I would be turned away if I landed in South Africa with that passport, the policy regime at the land borders was less rigid and I could make it to my event if I could find my way to Bike Bridge. As it happened, I had an event in Harare on July 20, and while I had not initially planned to attend it, I was suddenly presented with an opportunity to fulfill a long-held dream of visiting Zimbabwe. I was less than pleased with the travel arrangements to South Africa after my event, which consisted of a bus from Harare to Johannesburg, then a flight to Cape Town, but it was the best that could be done under the circumstances. On July 17, I arrived at Kotoka Airport for my Kenya Airways flight to Harare via Nairobi. There, I was informed that the airline was not sure whether the visa-free status of Ghanaian passport holders traveling to Zimbabwe would hold for my particular Ghanaian passport. To my immense displeasure, I ended up missing the flight that night. I rang up the Zimbabwean embassy in Accra to ask them whether I needed a visa or not. The lady on the phone said that I did not need a visa and that it was the prerogative of the airline to decide whether to let me board or not, depending on its own travel document or information policy. If the airline was happy to let me board, she said, I would be allowed into Zimbabwe without incident. Atlas Network had paid for the flight, and I informed them of the snafu before I paid for a new ticket for Magata Harare, this time with the Ethiopian Airlines. Magata assured me that I would be refunded for the unplanned expense. The next day, I boarded my flight to Addis Ababa on route Harare. 
I distinctly remember realizing that the aircraft was a Boeing 737 Max and making a dark joke about it on Twitter. Dark humor or not, I did not expect any trouble on this trip, and the only part of it that elicited any unease was the thought of the 11-hour drive from Harare to Johannesburg. Well, at least I'll get to experience the Zimbabwean countryside, was the thought I consoled myself with. That never happened. It all started after the connecting flight from Addis Ababa landed in Harare, and the whole Airbus A350 went up in applause and ululation. You know that sound from the gods must be crazy. I should have known at that moment that I was in a truly different kind of country, even by African standards. As we filtered into the immigration area, I noticed Chinese passengers folding $100 bills into their passports and handing them over to the lady in the other nationalities. It had never occurred to me that I would need to pay a bribe to enter Zimbabwe of all places and had no cash on me, save for 2,000 Ethiopian beer, which is about 35 US dollars. The lady told me to stand aside when she saw my passport. Soon, only two passengers were left as the other passengers filtered through and went to pick up their bags. Eventually, she came back to me and told me that I was a Nigerian who was in Zimbabwe illegally and I was going to be denied entry. I furiously tried to explain that A, this was a Ghanaian passport, which the Ghanaian government had repeatedly assured me carried the full travel privileges of an ordinary Ghanaian passport, and B, their own embassy in Accra had confirmed to me that I did not need a visa. All this was to no effect. The other passenger who was denied entry was a Ugandan citizen holding an ordinary Ugandan passport. There was absolutely no reason to deny her entry because Uganda and Zimbabwe have a visa free travel relationship with each other. But as I was slowly starting to understand, this was one country that was truly lawless, even by the lofty Nigerian standards of lawlessness that I was used to. Whether she had all the right paperwork or not, her vocal refusal to pay a $100 bribe was to be punished with the removal from the country in plain sight of everyone without a single hint of shame or discomfort by anyone. We were both led to a windowless detention room, which was locked from the outside. There was what appeared to be a bottle of pee on the floor, and the filthy yellow walls were covered in graffiti, scrolled by previous occupants of this floor, who had apparently gone through similar and didn't to understand my conditions. The lady's name was Aisha, and she seemed to be severely distraught by our situation, especially as the hours ticked by. One hour became two. Three hours, four hours, six hours. By some miracle, the Wi Fi at Robert Mugabe International Airport suddenly began working, and I was able to call everybody it was possible to call. Charmaine, the James Curry Society president, drove to the airport to speak to someone. But Maya even managed to get through to a senior airport official to intercede on my behalf. Sometimes they have to stay up with an associate. Finally, I had had enough. I had already booked my return flight to Addis Ababa, and I just wanted to leave Zimbabwe and go home. Cape Town would have to wait. So I went to Twitter, and I hit the new clip. Later on, I would find out that this decision is probably saved my day come that night. Shortly after I put out the tweets, and the Zimbabwean authorities began dealing with the PR disaster, Aisha and I were escorted to the departure area to wait for our exit flight to Addis Ababa. Excuse me. Finally, even though my ordeal had indeed been stopped by my inability to pay a one hundred dollar bribe, visa or no visa, the Zimbabweans had rapidly figured out who I was, and they were having a conversation with the Nigerian High Commission about what to do. Handing me over to the Nigerians would have been against international law, of course, but this was Zimbabwe. Half the government was already on some international sanctions list. Another sanction to add to the other 50 really would have made no difference to them, as long as a good enough offer was made. Before such an offer could be made, I hit the population switch, and they were left with no choice but to kick me out of their country as quickly as they could manage. But not without first making sure to drop the most malicious grenade into my life. This fellow who worked in Zimbabwe's information ministry eventually effectively gave away my location and the nationality of my travel documents. This would have immense implications for me in just a few days' time, though I had no idea. Evelyn Okaku from the Committee to Protect Journalism, Journalist, CPJ, reached out during all of this to ask me whether I felt safe. I remember thinking to myself, what sort of dumb question is this? Do you know how to read? 
In any case, she promptly disappeared as CPJ issued no statement, something that will become a bit of a theme going forward. For the time being, I was able to get safely back to Accra, where Yvonne met up with me after making it to her own speaking session in Cape Town. Kenyan passport privilege was a real thing. All right, uh, thank you very much, David, for that beautiful reading. Um, I'm looking forward to your new to, to reading your new book, Breaking Point, from my Billy Man Publishing. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being here once again. Um, all, right, um, all right, quick stuff. I'm going to ask all readers to keep to keep to the five minutes framework now, since we have um, limited time left. So please, let's stick to five minutes each reader. Thank you very much. Let's welcome Chinaza Ezia Hiala to read her work. Chinaza, you have the stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone. I feel so blessed to be amongst other writers and artists. Um, disclaimer, but based on the kind of works I've heard from here, I'm probably going to be stuck in a lot of you. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll be reading from my short horror story, A Dose of Insights. Um, let's get to it. But they felt everything. He could feel his legs shattered in different places. He could not move his hands, but could feel they were there. His breathing felt like that of a drowning man, suffocating. He felt a searing pain that started within his legs and ascended into his brain. There was a moistness in his trousers that felt like urine mixed with feces. He opened his mouth to scream, but it stayed shut. He could taste metal on his tongue. He willed himself to move, yet his body resisted. He could hear muffled screams as people gathered around his body. They are standing too close, he thought. He opened his eyes to see a man dressed in briefs and a plain shirt speaking into a phone with a hand on his bloodstained forehead. He tried to speak to the man, but his senses dulled. His eyes opened and closed, each closing drawing him deeper and deeper into unconsciousness. The last thing he thought about was Esosa's smiling face. The last thing Bode heard was the sound of the junior doctor's footsteps hurrying out of the call room, holding their noses, one of them stifling a giggle while avoiding eye contact. Bode sat on the bed, pressing his ties together in a tight clasp, watching some people gathered at the accident and emergency car park from his call room window. An old man, gasping mouthfuls of breath and in obvious respiratory distress, an old woman thrashing her hands about while crying beside the dazed young man, resting his jaw on his palm. His eyes met those of the young man's and looked away, a innocent glance. He sucked his teeth because the call had been uneventful so far, and now here was work that would only further delay him. He had hoped that he would score a home run all the way to Esosa. Now this. But they hated calls. He could care less. Besides, his shift was almost over, and he had intentionally avoided getting, attending to these people in order to hand them over to the morning team. He glanced at the clock and began gathering his things into his backpack, eager to leave before the end of his call time. From the call room entrance, Nostiti motioned to him to attend to the patient outside. Dr. Bode, emergency, she said, hands akimbo in the corridor. She then walked back to the triage area from the window from the window, he watched as she walked to the people he had seen earlier. When he was sure that she was fully engaged, he grabbed his backpack and made his way to the back exit to avoid the triage area and Titi's glare. As he made his way to the back exit, he put his hands in his pockets, not hearing the anticipated jangle of keys, but they turned back to the call room in search of them. He found them nestled in the crevices of his call room mattress and grabbed them when a notification popped up on his phone five missed calls from Esosa. He sent her a text, I'll be there in an hour. He remembered when Esosa had come home the night before wearing those pink shorts he liked so much, the ones that contrasted against her dark skin. She had come home to deliver his food, sashaying her way into the call room, despite knowing that family members were not allowed there. Engaging Titi with her jaw jokes as Titi escorted her out of the call room. He could have sworn he heard Titi laugh, a foreign sound that remained etched in his mind. Walking out of the call room, he dialed the colleague who was to take over for him. If he had looked through the call room window, he would have noticed that. Oh, 